weeks here for me? Yeah, it's a um, Okay, so we're dealing with this, this uh, type of demand model here. Excuse me. So, um, well, the idea is basically we have some data like that, and we suspect uh, a power model, a demand model like this is correct, and we want to find values for these guys here, the parameters, and we realize this model is not linear, and none of our uh, known tricks are going to work on it, so we have to figure out something new, and this thing that is new is going to be this. So the function that we will uh, use to solve this problem is called the natural logarithm. It's a classical mathematical function. And it has two key properties that uh, will uh, turn out to be magic for our purposes. It's um, these two here. So whenever you take two numbers and multiply them, so if you say f of x is this function ln x, so it's a mathematical function. If you take a product of two numbers, you apply f to them, then this will be the same as first applying f to a and f to b, and then adding the results. Now this seems there is no way normal people would see why this solves our problem immediately, but it will uh, in, in conjunction with the second property, which is uh, more or less the same actually, but it says if I take a power, so I take a raised to the b, I apply f to that, this is the same as taking the exponent b times f applied to a. Okay, so we call this 1 and 2. And we're not going to show mathematically why this is true for this particular magic function, but it's just going to use these properties to do what we want to do. Okay. So. So maybe let's see what I thought. Yeah, I, I think just just before doing this, let's have a brief look at this uh, function. What is it actually? Just to not to pull rabbits too much out of the hat here. So this is not in the notes here. You can find it in any economics or math book of any uh, standard. Or you can check Wikipedia or whatever. But the definition of the natural logarithm is something as follows. Well, let's, let's start with, uh, sorry. Let's start with something slightly different. This number, e, is a natural constant. You, I'm sure you have seen it in some of your math courses way back. Um, it's something like this. And then an endless series of decimals. But it's one of the major natural constants, along with uh, pi and a few others. Uh, so it looks like this. The reason why I happen to remember nine decimals here is that this is the birth year of uh, the great uh, Norwegian author Henrik Ibsen. So if you remember this much, you're going to remember that much. 
and this is easy to remember. OK, so then you can define the function. This is what we call the exponential function, the natural exponential function, e to the u. Let's just take this number and raise it to the power of u. So you can take e to the 2 is equal to 2.718, blah, 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 raised to 2. So there's nothing, it's a, just a number, OK? But it's, it plays a particular role in science. in the remains same? Hmm? The value for e will remain same? The value is, this is a constant, right? Mm -hmm. So I just call it e. It's like, it plays the same role as pi. Hmm? Yes, 2.1. Yeah, and now I don't remember much okay. more. But this also goes on forever. OK, so anyone who has seen this function knows that if you take u here and you take e to the u here, it's going to be, if you take e to the 0, it's going to be 1. And then it's an exponential growth with this particular base number. Um, so now we define um, uh, u equal to ln x. So I'm defining what does it mean to say for, for a given number, x greater than 0. Then u equals uh, ln x if uh, x equals e to the u. So it's actually, for those who know a little bit about mathematics, it's the inverse function of the exponential. And it's not possible for us to figure out many values of this by brain, unless you uh, probably belong to some institution or something. Um, but we can say that, for instance, <laughs> um, say ln. 1 equals what? Well, it's, I mean, this is, this is tricky if you are not into it. And it's even tricky for me because it's, I have to think backwards. But it's 0. Because, because 0 is exactly the number that I need to take e to 0 to get 1 here. And I can compute one particular value more. I can say that somewhere there's this value e, and logarithm of that has to be 1, because e equals, of course, e to the first. Right. So I can do a few of those things, but generally I'm depending on a calculator to to compute such values. Now, maybe to familiarize this a little bit more, this e to the u thing here is what you normally on your calculator write x u, or sometimes with capital letters. So it's the exponential natural function. And the lo natural logarithm is just the inverse function. So. It works by this definition. And I think, well, this is just important in one aspect because it, this is what's going to help us get from the estimates of the demand model back to the original problem, actually. Right. So maybe I took a little bit too much of the blackboard here. E to the u equals x. You. Okay. And just a little step in here. Here, XL, you make some X values with increasing like this up from 0 0.01 up to 7. And here, insert a function in XL that's called LM with reference to that cell. So this is the natural logarithm in Excel. 
And then when I plot the graph, it looks like this. You see at 1 here, x is 1, it cuts exactly 0. And 2.71 somewhere here, it cuts exactly to 1. And then it increases more and more slowly over here. And as x goes to 0, it dives down to minus infinity, actually. So it will only be defined for positive numbers. Because there's no number u that you can take e and raise to a number and get something negative. Right. And you can't even get 0. OK. So this is just a tip if you like Excel a little bit. And if someone tells you something confusing in mathematics, try to play a little bit with Excel. Um, Sometimes you can learn a little bit from that. Um, OK. So just one, the important consequence here, actually. Um, this is what we need all this thing for. If if this value is known, if you know the logarithm of a number a, and then we often want to know what is a, then we find a as what exp or k k e to the b or exp b or exp ln a. All of these are the same, of course. But this, we, this is something we're going to use. If I know the logarithm of a number, and I want the number itself, I'm going to have to go back via the exponential function. So if, for example, if ln to a happens to be 0 0.5, I can know this from SPSS or something. Then what is a? the exponential of ln to a. And I know this is 0 0.5, so it's exp 0 0.5, which I can compute with my calculator and not my brain. And it's about 1.65. Okay. So I can go back from knowing logarithmic values to original values by using the exponential function. So this is the important thing for practical use of this logarithmic transformation, actually. So it's a consequence of the definition, of course. Now, So you can believe me that this function has these properties. And if you don't, you can use Excel again. This is something that I like with Excel. Here's a very small experiment. Here is um, an x value, two x values, 5 and 6. And here is the product. So I can write the product. <coughs> And here is ln to x. Here is ln y. OK. Actually, my, my notation here is a little bit crazy, I see. Uh, let's do it a little bit differently, I think. This is x. This is y. And this is x times y. And ln x. This is 
ln y and this is ln x times y and um, and uh, just to check this second property no this first property here is the sum of the logarithms so my statement here says that the, the logarithm of the products should be equal to the sum of the two logarithms right so it's just for the uh, what do you call the non-believers who f refuse to believe that this is true you can at least check it for any kind of numbers here so if you put 4 and 3 the product is 12 the logarithm of 12 is 2.485 the logarithm of 4 and 3 are here and the sum of those two is here and so on and here you can do any kind of numbers you like. And if Excel does it work well, it should always be the same. So it kind of verifies this, you know, in a computational way. Now, the more important thing is how does these properties solve our problem? Well, look at the uh, where is my whip? Oh, someone. Oh, it's hanging here. No, it's not a whip. It's in old days, they, the teachers actually used this to, <laughs> to punish pupils. That's horrible. Yeah. Um, in Norway, we call it a Spanish, Spanish pipe or something. In Spain, what do you call it? A Norwegian pipe <laughs> yeah well we don't use it much anymore only in special cases in this master program um, yeah so the idea as I, as I showed you we have y and x and we now want to compute yeah f of y and f of x and use these as our new variables in SPSS sense. So what I'm going to show you is if these two guys are related with this demand function then the logarithms will be linearly related. So it's not that difficult actually because you start here, here <coughs> is the original uh, relationship and then I compute f applied to y so that's my left hand side okay so that's going to be f of c times x times a well c times x times a that's a product of two numbers namely c times x times a so if you take f of that I'm having an extra parenthesis in here it's going to be f of c plus f of that. That's applying one. Now this is just now a constant, f of c, but here says f of x to the a. Well, x to the a is clearly a power, so I can use this rule here to take the exponent in front and then just f of the base number here. So the a's <coughs> play different roles in these two equations but it's just a power. So it's going to be f of c plus a times f of x. So it's by 1 and 2. The two we, we use both of these properties and then we arrive here and if you look at this, it's already here. It says f of y, which is going to be my new dependent variable, is a constant plus a constant times f of x. So it's a linear relationship between f of y and f of x. And if you want to do it in great detail, you rename the variables. So I call u 
is my f of y. So it's this variable. It's just saying that I give the name u here. And I give the name set here to f of x. And I rename this constant f of c to b. Then the relationships read just as this. Okay. Yep. So it's a straight linear relationship between the two uh, new variables. So we're going to do this with SPSS. We're going to start with some original data looking nonlinear, and then compute the logarithm of y and the logarithm of x, then estimate a linear uh, model. And then we find, uh, well, you note that the, the new relationship, it looks like this. So the A here is the original A. So it's going to come out as it is. This is the price elasticity, actually. So it's going to read straight out of the logarithmic model. But if we want to go back and find the C value from our SPSS estimates, you know that we have estimated only the logarithm of C. So this is what I call B. But that means C equals x of b by what I called important here. Hmm? So when I know when I estimate ln to c, I get the constant from this back transformation. And if you want, you can talk about estimates. Then you just put hats on these things here. So suppose we run a regression analysis and we find that the constant term in that regression is 0 0.34. Then my s estimate for the original C parameter is x 0 0.34. That's 1.405. Right. So this bit is a bit um, uh, heavy, but uh, you probably will take it easier when you sit down on the computer and do some exercises. Um, yeah, just a word about. Oh, okay, this figure is coming. Up. So these are actually those data here, now transformed with the logarithm. So it's the logarithm of x and the logarithm of y for the same data as you saw before. And you see here, it's fairly well suited for a linear regression now. Uh, just a word about something we ignored a little bit in the computations with our model. We need to include some randomness here. And this is very usually assumed as a multiplicative factor in the original demand model. So you have some random factor here, which is typically expected value 1. And then the demand given price is this curve, and then multiplied with something that is 1 plus minus a small factor. Yeah, typically with mean value 1. And you can run this formula or these properties on this equation also, and you end up with this one. So you get a new error term looking like this. And then if you rename the error term to u, you are back with the original linear regression model. OK. So that's the theory. Let's, uh, let's see. Yeah. So we're seeing the end here. So 
this data that I'm going to show you here, they are actually uh, not real data. They are simulated. So I took the value C of 1,000. I took an um, elasticity of minus 2. And then I sort of created randomly uh, data from this model. And then I want to estimate and see if I, I mean, it's interesting to see when you do this, you estimate how close do you get to your actual original values. Um, so my A estimate for these data was at minus 1.96, which is not far away from the god given value of minus 2. And the constant C hat is found to be x6.85, which is about 943, which is an estimate of what we know is the true value, 1,000. Right. So this is, this is then how such data would look in the simplest case. You have a price for a commodity, say every month or every week you have this price and then the, the amount sold is, the, is what do you call the demand here. And we can make a scatter plot of these guys. I hope yeah, we can do that. And with price here and demand here, it comes out. Um, no. Here. So this is typically this nonlinear structure. Um, So just just to make sure you that you know what I did here, I just uh, sort of I decided some values for a zero or okay a and c was one thousand, and then I generated. x1, x2, to x if it's 40 points here. So I just draw randomly using Excel or something some prices. Then computed um, c times xi to the uh, a using these values. So I compute the exact curve. And then disturb with some randomness. So I think I generated some random noise and made something like C, X, I, A. So I took these perfect values and just uh, spread them out a bit with my some random generator. Yeah, something like this. And then pretend that this is real data, try to estimate. C and A using a regression. So I blur the picture with my randomness, and then I try to see if my regression can rediscover some close values for this. This is called a simulation. And it's I think it's a, this is a very good way of learning uh, statistics. If you, if you want to learn about logarithmic transformation, try to make your own data like this. You know you can play God by giving the parameters, and then see if you can come back and estimate after you did something to the data. And of course, the more you disturb your data, the more difficult it will be to get back to these values. So this is what I did here, and 
But we can, of course, pretend that this is some sort of business data. And I don't like the picture, and I assume a demand model, so I want to estimate. And I want to do that with logarithms. So go back to the data. I need to compute these two variables. And this is not difficult. Compute variable. And you give them some reasonable name, ln price. That's going to be the logarithm of the price. So you find here in the function menu in this calculator, under arithmetic functions, ln. And of course, you can just write ln up here if you, if you like. It's probably faster. ln of the price and compute OK and then do the same with the um, demand and I call it ln demand okay. and then the theory dictates that this the new two variables should look much more linear in their dependent so I go to my scatter plot here and take the two new. Okay, let's look at the variables first. Cancel. So here, here you see the new numbers. Um, yeah, there's not much to, to. I mean, to look from at the numbers, you can't say much. But if you look at the scatter plot, um, we take the logarithm of the price versus the logarithm of the demand. And you click OK. And you get something. Like this. So I now want to just fit a line to this. And this line will be the linear model. And it will be, of course, giving me back the, the A and the C here. So where do we find the regression is here. Now linear regression dependent should be this. This is the logarithm of the demand. And the independent, in this case, the um, logarithm of the price. And maybe we want to see confidence intervals for coefficients. should be ln y equals ln c plus a times ln x. So note the nice thing about this is that the thing that we are usually most interested in is the price elasticity. And this is readable directly from this uh, output. Because this a wasn't transformed in the, I mean, it, it didn't change in the transformation. So this a hat is this estimate sitting here, which is the coefficient of the log price in this model. It's about minus 1.96 versus my given value of 2 here. And you see the confidence interval that we need to take into account given the uncertainty. If this is a confidence interval for A. It's about from minus 2.10 to minus 1.8. So it covers this value, which is uh, comforting in a way. Now, supposing I would go back and find my C value. I don't have the my C value, but I have the constant from the regression. It's now ln to C. It's this value here. OK, let's call it, I could put hats on these guys then. But 
So you read from the regression ln c is 6.85. That means c equals, or I need to put hats here, otherwise it's going to be crazy. Yeah. So these are the estimates from uh, the regression, and these are the true a and c values. So ln to the c hat is 6.85. It means c hat itself is x 6.85. And this is uh, the number that I had on my slides, 947 or something. 943. There. And you could also get the confidence interval for the C here. Then you would need to take the exp of the lower bound and the exp of the upper bound and look what you get. And I'm quite sure it's going to be on either side of 1,000. So this is how we do it. This is the very important price elasticity. And I'm quite sure that a fair amount of you will actually be doing this somewhere, sometime in your program to estimate price elasticity. It's quite important in economics. Okay. So, then, short note about. Um, Multiple models, it's no point in being very detailed, but you will see, I think some of the exercises deals with this. It's, um, as we talked about last week, very common that you operate in a market where you are not a monopolist. So it's not only your own price that's gonna uh, affect your demand, but also what the competing services do with their prices and possibly other, other variables. So you could have a demand model like this. This is maybe your own price where you would have a negative elasticity. And this, these are competing prices where you would have positive elasticities. So if the competitors raise their prices, it should theoretically increase the demand for your product if everything else is the same. And it's just to apply this logarithm repeatedly to the left and the right hand side of this equation and you, you turn out with something like this, which is a multiple linear model in the new logarithm variables. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what I said about the typical sign of the elasticities and this exercise will show you a guided tour through an application of this. Um, yeah, two slides more this semester. Um, so first one, uh, this is So this is something that will appear in many types of, of demand models. Um, suppose you have um, demand for airline travel and weeks. One, two, three, four. You have a huge number of weeks and then you have demand here, you have price. Um, blah, 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 blah. And prices can vary. But then there happens something, for instance, if um, yeah, you can have what we call seasonal uh, variations, right? So suppose summer traffic is 15% or 20% uh, higher um, given the fixed, I mean, given the same prices you would expect a 20% price increase in some. 
Okay, then you can look at the weeks. If this is, this is the weeks in the year, then this is not the summer week, 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 blah, 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 blah. And then you come to some time where you define it summer. And it goes from 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, let's call it D. So you take your demand model, which is, say, with one price, and you multiply with R times D. Then what happens? Well, if R, if D is zero, and this is one, so you have your base model. But if D is one, then R to the D is, well, R. So it's 1.20 in that case. Uh, okay, I didn't say that here, but it says that. So then you get y equals c times x1. And here I forgot an a. It's getting late in the day. Times 1.20. And this is perfectly a 20% increase relative to the base model. So this is how you could model such, for instance, seasonal increases or decreases in demand. If you put 0 0.80 here, you would rather say that it's a 20% drop in the demand. And you can, believe me, it's written out more in the compendium, but if you do the logarithmic transform of this, it will also become linear. So you might estimate the interesting number. This is not something that you decide, of course. I'm not deciding that my summer demand is going to be 20% higher. It's some, something I want to estimate, perhaps. So you transform this model, and you will be able to estimate this, and this, and this, in the same way. Okay. So apparently, there's something about that in exercise 7. Um, So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but for instance, uh, when you want to decide pricing decisions and so on in a supply chain, it's fundamentally important to understand how the market will respond to your price changes. And that's exactly what we do when we estimate elasticities. Um, And I had on my notes a little example. It's probably maybe calculated a little bit in the compendium. But given that you have good estimates in such a model like this, so let's say good estimates. like this, it means you can compute, for instance, optimal prices. Or close to optimal prices if you accept a, some error in the estimate. So you can based on this plus this will have something to do with your income from the sales of this product and then you need to know something about the cost of supplying this service but given that you can come close to computing something which we could call optimal prices and the warning here um, is of course is this the right model we're doing optimal things and so on but it's a model still and I told you a couple of weeks ago that all models are false and that's just one well I mean 
these demand models can be quite reliable as long as you stay within the price area. But my little point here, which I thought to do a little computation about, but I don't have time for it, is that you may have price data like here. And you estimate this, this function here. And you get your optimal price out here. Now this is a little bit dangerous because uh, the estimates that you have, they should ideally only be used at best. I mean, this regression model is at best only valid in, in where you have your observations. So it's kind of dangerous if you find an answer that points to a price that is just way out of your observed universe, in a sense. OK. Yeah. So we'll stop there. That's all there is uh, to this course. We're going to go Thursday, do some SPSS exercises. And then next week, uh, we'll just um, try to sum up everything as best as we can. So follow up on Frontier. I will provide you with uh, as much exam preparation material as we have available. And um, I think it's going to be OK in the end. <laughs>